ಓಂ ತತ್ಸತ್ ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಗುಡ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಫ್ರೆಂಡ್ಸ್ ಟುಡೆ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಥರ್ಡ್ ಡೇ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಥರ್ಡ್ ಸೀರೀಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ಎಮ್ ಗೋಣ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂ ಸ್ಪೀಕಿಂಗ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ದಿ ವೈದಿಕ ಧರ್ಮ ಸಂಪ್ರದಾಯಸ್ಥರು ದಟ್ ಐ ಬಿಗ್ಯಾನ್ ಎಸ್ಟಡೆ ವಿ ಸಾ ಸಮ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಎಮಿನೆಂಟ್ ಪರ್ಸನಾಲಿಟೀಸ್ ದಟ್ ಡಿ ವಿ ಗುಂಡಪ್ಪ ವಾಸ್ ಇಂಟಿಮೆಟ್ಲಿ ಫೆಮಿಲಿಯರ್ ವಿತ್ ಪುಣ್ಯಶ್ಲೋಕ ವೆಂಕಟರಾಮ ಭಟ್ಟ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ವೆಂಕಟ ನಾರಾಯಣ ಭಟ್ಟ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಫ್ಯೂ ಅದರ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಪೌರಾಣಿಕಾಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಪುರೋಹಿತಾಸ್ ನೌ ವಿ ಕಮ್ ಟು ಎ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಟ್ರೆಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಕಾಲ್ಡ್ ಚಂದ್ರಶೇಖರ ಶಾಸ್ತ್ರಿ ಹಿ ಹೇಳ್ಡ್ ಫ್ರಾಮ್ ದಿ ಟೌನ್ ಆಫ್ ಶ್ರೀನಿವಾಸಪುರ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿ ಅರೈವ್ಡ್ ಇನ್ ಮುಳುಬಾಗಿಲು ಆ್ಯಸ್ ಎ ಹೆಡ್ ಮಾಸ್ಟರ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಆಂಗ್ಲೋ ವರ್ನಾಕ್ಯುಲರ್ ಸ್ಕೂಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಕ್ಯಾರೆಕ್ಟರ್ ಹಿಸ್ ವರ್ಕ್ ಎಥಿಕ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಸ್ಕಾಲರ್ಶಿಪ್ ದ ವೇ ಹಿ ವಾಸ್ ಮೂವಿಂಗ್ ಅರೌಂಡ್ ವಿತ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಅರ್ನ್ಡ್ ಹಿಮ್ ಅ ಲಾಟ್ ಆಫ್ ರೆಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಎಂಟೈರ್ ಫ್ಯಾಮಿಲಿ ವಾಸ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ರಿನೌಂಡ್ ಫ್ಯಾಮಿಲಿ ಎಸ್ ವೆಲ್ ಆಸ್ ಯೂಶುವಲ್ ಡಿ ವಿ ಗುಂಡಪ್ಪ ಪಿನ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ಸ್ ದಿ ಕ್ಯಾರೆಕ್ಟರಿಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ಫೀಚರ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ಪರ್ಸನಾಲಿಟಿ ಆಫ್ ಚಂದ್ರಶೇಖರ ಶಾಸ್ತ್ರಿ ಎ ರೇಡಿಯಂಟ್ ಫೇಸ್ ಎ ಲೌಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕ್ಲಿಯರ್ ವಾಯ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಅ ರಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಇಟ್ ಪ್ರೋವೆಸ್ ಇನ್ ಡೆಲಿವರಿಂಗ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕೋರ್ಸಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅ ಶಾರ್ಟ್ ಟೆಂಪರ್ ಸೊ ದಿಸ್ ವಾಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಹಿ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಶಾರ್ಟ್ ಟೆಂಪರ್ ಹಿ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಅ ವುಡನ್ ರೂಲರ್ ಇನ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಹ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವುಡ್ ವ್ಯಾಕ್ ದಿ ಹ್ಯಾಂಡ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಎನಿಬಡಿ ಹೂ ಮೇಡ್ ಅ ಮಿಸ್ಟೇಕ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿ ವಾಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಅ ನೈಸ್ ವೇ ಆಫ್ ಗಿವಿಂಗ್ ನಿಕ್ ನೇಮ್ಸ್ ಟು ಹಿಸ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ವೆನ್ ವಿ ಲುಕ್ ಅಟ್ ಸಮ್ ಆಫ್ ದೀಸ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಟು ಡೇಸ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ವ್ಯೂ ವಿ ವಿಲ್ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಓ ಮೈ ಗಾಡ್ ಹೌ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ದೆರ್ ಬಿ ಯು ನೋ ಕಾರ್ಪೊರಲ್ ಪನಿಷ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಿಟಿಂಗ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಲೈಕ್ ದಟ್ ಬಟ್ ಡಿ ವಿ ಜಿ ಹಿಮ್ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಸೇಸ್ ಇನ್ ಮೆನಿ ಇನ್ ಮೆನಿ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟೆನ್ಸಸ್ ನನ್ ಆಫ್ ದೀಸ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಮ್ಯಾಟರ್ಡ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ವಿ ವರ್ ವೆರಿ ಆಬ್ಸ್ಟಿನೆಟ್ ವಿ ವರ್ ಥಿಕ್ ವಿ ವರ್ ಸ್ಟೂಪಿಡ್ ಸೊ ದಿಸ್ ವಾಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಇಫ್ ಈವನ್ ದಿಸ್ ವಾಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ದೇರ್ ವುಡ್ ಹಾವ್ ಟರ್ನ್ಡ್ ಔಟ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಸಮಥಿಂಗ್ ಟೋಟಲಿ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ಇನ್ ಸಮ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟೆನ್ಸಸ್ ಐ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಫೀಲ್ ದಟ್ ಡಿ ವಿ ಜಿ ಯೂಸ್ ಟು Uh, insert some sort of a commentary so that the readers of the present generation not suddenly shocked because he was writing about a period 70 years 80 years prior to uh, when readers were reading it in the 1970s so here and there he would i think he has added certain things to uh, soften the uh, shock that people would get when they read about the past dvg writes because he was short tempered we were very scared of him because he also had a great sense of humor we admired him and because he had intimate reverence for knowledge we respected him so three fold reaction towards the same person fear because he was so strict and he had a short temper admiration because he was so humorous and he would connect with people and reverence because he was so deeply knowledgeable and students hailing from different varnas different jatis attended his classes like i told you yesterday when we see these uh, episodes again and again we we will find many instances of harmonious existence between the various the people of the different communities uh, it is totally different to the uh, very morbid picture painted by the latter day pseudo intellectuals who try to uh, um, uh, um, highlight Uh, a sort of oppression a very ghastly uh, situation of that time but many many instances whether we read a, um, uh, you know uh, like a pen portrait in this case of dvg or a deeply researched work like uh, dharampal's beautiful tree we see so many instances of this harmonious coexistence and it's very important to observe that uh chandrashekar shastri used to uh, teach literature he was also very very well versed with vedic uh, uh, recitation and uh, the way in which he would recite poetry is setting it to a certain raga was so alluring that many times people will be more interested in the meal time uh, recitation of uh, chandrashekar shastri rather than the food which is very rare because usually people are more interested in food but in this case he will take a verse he will sing it he will select a very dignified raga and the entire assembly would lapse into silence so when you are forgetting yourself then there is no need for food as well he was also known
he would uh, he was uh, himself a gourmet he used to love good food sometimes he would meet dvg's grandmother and he used to say it has been so long since i ate your ragi mudde and curry uh, when i i wish uh, i'll have a chance to have it again and this kind of a gourmet he really enjoyed good food and he was also a very skilled cook he would make a different uh, uh, vast array of broths and curries and uh, palyas and different uh, things and on the day of the shashti he would invite Uh, sometimes dvg sometimes other uh, brahmacharis but in this case dvg to his house he would wash the feet of the brahmachari so brahmachari is probably 8 years old or 10 years old or 12 years old and here is somebody who is 50 he would wash the feet because there was great reverence not for that particular person but for what he represented a person who has had initiation into studies who has devoted his life for serious like i mentioned yesterday that when uh, 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 dvg's uh, great uncle was trying to bring some uh, dancers and wanted to make uh, dvg the young dvg sit on a horse it was uh, venkatram bhatta said this is the time where he has to go to the guru's house and must be humble and keep away from perfumes he is not supposed to do so many things as a brahmachari all the things which are available to him all the bhoga as a grahastha as a student it is forbidden because that is a time for him to absorb all the knowledge he ha- should not have distractions if you look at any of the great performers who have excelled in whether the people who get into iits or uh, this kind of uh, Uh, um, acing these competitive exams and getting into premier institutes or you take people who get into ias uh, ips who clear the upsc exam or any great musician great athletes they all have a similar kind of lifestyle in fact uh, one of the reasons why lot of people don't want to train under uh, p gopi chand is because he says you keep your mobile away for 3 months Uh, you have to prepare for the championship you cannot be having a mobile phone and lot of people would cannot uh, accept that because today it has become such an integral part of the life but like i said yesterday this was the uh, state of every brahmachari at that point of time what today is only reserved for the most elite at, uh, athletes and great musicians and uh, great performers it was almost practiced in the life of every average brahmachari he was not allowed to do so many things because it was a period of time it was a short period of time typically between 8 or 9 years up to 16 or 17 years then he would be married and then he would start a life of a householder which included all the bhoga which was uh, prescribed by dharma so coming back to the shashti day he would invite uh, dvg wash his feet offer a dhoti then he would feed him lunch and this was a elaborate feast involving ambode and paisam and so many other delicacies and uh, the speciality was his rasam he would add a little bit of coconut water and some kobri and that would uh, make it uh, taste very nice and then when dvg you ask ask him why are you giving me a dhoti he says you are a brahmana you must take it and you must accept the dakshina and that was the uh, standard that was maintained at that that point of time and uh, at the end of this passage dvg write it is not an exaggeration to say that i have been greatly influenced by chandrashekar shastri he had known hardships in lives in life he had seen suffering in his family life he had undergone the tribulations of poverty he stood rock like amidst the in the midst of unspeakable calamity and poverty without ever losing heart and one of his favorite works was the shiva parada kshamapana stotra and those who have heard him recite this in the someshwara devalaya invariably experienced a deep stirring within their own lives so a person who has seen difficulty who has accepted it embraced it and transcended it will naturally just by his very presence becomes a great inspiration for others around him because when you see somebody who is facing difficulty and yet he has a smile on his face yet he is friendly with everybody that itself is inspiring he doesn't have to give any upadesha his life itself becomes an upadesha then there is a very interesting episode of uh, chandrashekar shastri and uh, the the, the uh, his approach towards economy when you look at uh, when dvg says when we when we were young in those days we used to think he was very niggardly so what used to happen the school headmaster had an additional duty uh, which was not a major one it was a minor duty he would double up as a book agent so the books would come from the government book depot 
and people, the students had to order for books and he would sell the books to the students who had ordered it and whatever was unsold at the end of the year would be sent back to the government book depot. And for that, he would get an additional uh, convenience fee of uh, two rupees or something like that. So what uh, Shastri would do when the books came from the book depot, he would not cut the threads that were binding it. He would slowly untie the threads. And even as he taught the class, his fingers will be busy untying the knots of this uh, bundle. Sometimes there will be a complicated knot, but without losing patience, even as he taught the subject, he would untie the knot and slowly take it and he would roll it around his fingers and then after uh, rolling it and uh, he would put a small easy knot that can be removed, keep it aside and the wrapping paper which was uh, which the books were wrapped in, he would take that out, fold it neatly and keep it away and then once the books that were not sold had to be sent back to the government book depot, he would wrap it in these saved up paper and use the same thread and send it. Sometimes uh, people would say, what is this, sir, the same old paper, same old thread, why do you show so much care? Then he would say, your intelligence is divine, and divine obviously in a very sarcastic, uh, uh, dripping with sarcasm, your intelligence is divine. If I spend 50 paisa on these items, what will remain of the paltry 2 rupees I get as a convenience fee? Later in his life, DVG understands this and he also follows this principle in his daily life. And Chandrasekhar Shastri had uh, three sons and two daughters and they also grew up to be very uh, valuable individuals and uh, his, uh, his family was a very illustrious family and there are some details about uh, um, uh, his family and uh, also some of his students. Um, so with this, we come to the end of Chandrasekhar Shastri, a very remarkable person who was very influential in DVG's growth. Now, after talking about some of these uh, eminent personality, there are a couple of uh, chapters uh, in, this, uh, uh, in, the, in this book that talk about some of the Madhva Vidwans, Madhva eminences, and the Madhva Mandali of that time. Because uh, in addition to the small Smartha population in Munabagal, there was a sizable population of Madhva Brahmanas. There were hardly any Sri Vaishnavas because uh, there would be some people who come once in a while, but largely it was uh, Madhva Brahmanas and uh, among the Brahmanas. And there, were, uh, there was a big temple and there were two Mathas, which I'll come to. And uh, there, was a f there were a few Smartha Brahmanas. And uh, this consisted of about uh, 250 or 300 families of Madhva Brahmanas and they were largely divided into the upper Agrahara and the lower Agrahara of Mudabagal. There were uh, some prominent uh, individuals, the Swami of the, uh, the Sripad Raja Matha, Appanna Acharya of the Vyasaraya Matha, then Avaruru Narahari Acharya and his brother Raghavendra Acharya, then there was Madhavaraya Acharya and uh, like this there are few important individuals. So Avaruru Narahari Acharya and Raghavendra Acharya were brothers and uh, they were involved in free education for a large number of people. So the two brothers, both of them were great Vidwans, they would sit in two different halls of the uh, house and every, uh, every t at any point of time six or eight students would be there and primarily they taught Tarka which is logic and Vedanta and uh, starting from uh, 8 in the morning until 11, they would teach. Again in the evening from around 4 o'clock to 7 o'clock, they would teach. And these teachers, they took no salary. They taught all these for free. So there is no need of any scholarships for the students because education was free. There was no government grant for this school. The only capital investment was just for knowledge. If somebody was interested in learning, that was the fees they had to pay, not any monetary fees. And uh, uh, of course, Na Avaruru Na Narahari Acharya's son was uh, uh, his senior of DVG and they were, uh, he used to spend time in their family. He writes about some, uh, you know, some of uh, the details with regard to their lifestyle. They are uh, totally uh, uh, simple, leading a very simple life and a very important thing that DVG uh, observes it appeared as though they were completely unaware of the prowess of their scholarship. 
they never thought that they were great vidwans they had uh, fantastic knowledge of some subjects they were just teaching whatever they knew that was the mentality that they had they did not think of them although they were very high uh, quality vidwans very erudite scholars they never designated themselves as scholars they were just in the quest of trying to impart lessons to people who are interested without expecting anything and constantly engaging in the study of shastras performing the daily puja the regular vratas this was the the lifestyle and they did not have a, a money earning profession like paurohitya or any allied occupation and they never went out seeking any income if at all they got something they owned some lands whatever produce was uh, you know uh, from came from the land little bit they would get some money otherwise they never went out uh, searching for it and they were not bothered about money Uh, the shri pada raja matha and the majjige majjige halli swami matha these are the two major mathas in mulabagalo and during the annual rathotsava of the shri pada raja swami which is i think like the birth anniversary there used to be a, a huge uh, celebration uh, like a you know like a jatra and thousands of people would come arrive from various parts of the country to take place in the celebration lot of bhaktas would uh, uh, you know fill up all the mantapas large crowds of devotees would be there and there will be seven uh, several bhajan groups they are singing and they are doing lot of uh, uh, worshiping at the vrindavanas and so on and dvg calls it a serene commotion so it is there is commotion but it is very serene uh, the shri pada raja swami uh, sudhanandi tirtha shri pada was a very important person in dvg's life and uh, he was uh, dvg must have interacted with him when he was very young as a school going child but the memory is very strongly etched in his mind and every time he would uh, see him he would uh, uh, wherever he was he would perform a sashtanga namaskar a, a full uh, uh, prostration and uh, he would take the blessings of the uh, uh, swami ji and uh, every time uh, and uh, dvg says i firmly believe that his blessings continue to protect me even now here i will just take a moment to uh, uh, you know cogitate about uh, one facet of uh, looking back at the past whenever we look back at the past and think about the different episodes that happened to us there is no way that we can change the past this is very well known but when we look back at the past and recollect those instances where people have been kind to us where we have been blessed by great uh, scholars or great personalities where we have learned something really valuable from great people or we just had the sanidhya of some great personality these are the memories that will enrich our present day life on the other hand if we were to think i should have been there we both studied together but look at him he is somewhere a ceo of some company i am living in a mud house or you, i could have done this if i had cleared my je exam i would have been today in some part of the world both these sets of thinking will not change the past but the first way of thinking where you are grateful for the good things that have happened to you will make your present day life so much more happier and so much more peaceful whereas if you are constantly thinking about what could have been and how it didn't happen and how fate intervened or how that guy was uh, uh, you know had something going in his uh, favor or his uncle was an ias officer i came from a poor background and all this kind of thing what it does is actually it destroys the present quality of life and therefore when we see the style of reminiscences of a great person like dvg we can also learn how to remember the past what are the things of the past that it will be worthy for us to remember and what are the things it is better to forget this quality also we observe when he says that you know things like this person is akin to my grandfather my, whatever good has happened in my life is largely because of so and so if at all i know some two sentences in this language it's because of this, this person who took interest and taught me that kind of gratitude is very important for not for anybody else but for our own quality of life in the present time and uh, talking about uh, um, this uh, acharya he he says he was a very magnanimous person and he extended patronage and patience and friendship towards other sects 
he did not prohibit the sahapankti bhojana with smartas and other sects now this is important because today when we think about it it's not a big deal if you go to any restaurant in the people are sitting together from all backgrounds all nationalities and eating but in those days it was a big deal in a matha to uh, for they only allowed a certain group of people and for this uh, swami ji to say it doesn't matter we can allow other people it demonstrate a, a certain kind of inclusivity and magnanimity which we had to see in that context and not uh, without this uh, background hebbani srinivasacharya was also one of the swamis of the matha but before he became uh, a, a sanyasi srinivasacharya was the chief officer of the shri pada raja matha and the dvg fondly recalls that he was the person who taught him all the upanayana mantras it so happened that on the day of the upanayana of dvg shrinivas acharya was seated in the mantapa where the ceremony was performed and uh, dvg's grandfather asked him is there a difference in the sandhya vandana mantras recited by madhvas and smartas and he said the veda is same for everybody so really there is no difference whether it is madhva or uh, uh, smarta or shri vaishnava the veda is the same for everyone then immediately dvg's grandfather says in which case why don't you teach sandhya vandana to my boy every morning because our family purohita is so busy that he is travelling the whole morning for all his duties by the time he comes back it will it will be too late for madhyanika also so therefore why don't you uh, teach him uh, something here in the morning and it is hebbani uh, uh, shrinivas acharya who teaches dvg all the sandhya vandana mantras dvg writes there was little by way of difference between smartas vaishnavas and uh, all the other sects in those days people were endowed with magnanimity patience and friendship he talks about people who are from the mulukanadu sect who are uh, following the yajur veda then there were uh, people from the badaganadu sect who were uh, rigvedis then some of the people were like uluchikamme like uh, chandrashekar shastri who was also yajur vedi so none of these differences between smartha and madhva and these other factors none of these things came in the way of the vaidikas of mulabaglo respecting each other and from developing deep bonds of friendship then of course he gives a little bit of history about the matha and the different uh, uh, sanyasis who were the head mathadipatis and the, their purva purvashrama names and so forth and uh, finally he writes a little bit about hebbani sheshacharya where he has also spoken about in the first volume about hebbani sheshacharya and uh, then he talks about few other names which i will uh, which you can read about um what really we get from these uh, uh, episodes is how uh, different groups were living harmoniously but this was not always the case there were exceptions there were uh, bitter feelings and ill will which i will come to some of the episodes which which give a overall picture and because dvg has captured these rough edges as well that we can say with conviction that he is not biased towards one side he is very observant and he is writing with a sakshi bhava therefore much of what he has written we can take it at face value this gives a confidence because if somebody is writing a hagiography and saying only good things about somebody then even though that person may be sakshat uh, bhagwan shri krishna we begin to get uh, suspicions whether it is possible for somebody to be so good but when somebody captures the good and bad the uh, the positive negative then we get a feeling that here is a person who is looking from an objective view to the extend possible there is no human being who is can be perfectly unbiased then you will be a machine you will not be a human being you will have biases despite these biases if you can go beyond it and try to be as objective as possible that helps the readers get a good picture the next uh, uh, segment is that on uh, the galaxy of madhva vidwans and like uh, dvg has said earlier the main cash earnings for many of these vidwans was the lands that they had so whatever pulses and grains that they cultivated a portion of that would be sold and they would uh, um, get some money and this was typically not sufficient so therefore a new arrangement to supplement their earnings was made the shriman madhva siddhanto uh, siddhanto nahini sabha so this is the assembly for the development of the madhva philosophy 
was created and there was an annual congregation in Tiruchanur near Tirupati and there would be honorariums given to different people. This was started by one uh, Kanchi Subarao and he was at one point of time the Divan of uh, Travancore and he was uh, assisted by you know some uh, lawyer uh, Kai, uh, um, uh, Kaukuru Ramachandra Rao and few other people. And different Vidwans came from different centers of Madhva philosophy and they would take care of their stay and food and all the arrangements. And there would be an examination committee which was comprised of the best and most eminent Vidwans. And this committee would you know, test the prowess of these uh, different people in the texts of the Madhva philosophy like the Mani Manjari and Suma, uh, Sumadhva Vijaya, Vayustuti, Sudha, Chandrika, all these works. Uh, the, they will be uh, examining and all the people who appeared for the exams are all students of great acharyas. Of course, when the exams are conducted, some of the examiners will be somewhat partial to students of certain acharya and this kind of things are, are, are bound to happen in any organization. However, the overall situation was that the Sabha encouraged uh, scholarship in the Madhva philosophy. And later, of course, during due to some infights and everything, there is some other uh, sabha thing happened. Of course, here uh, DBG takes uh, a segue and talks about a hilarious episode that happens when Apparna Charya from the Vyasaraya Matha goes to this uh, uh, sabha and uh, he had distinguished himself for his scholarship and conduct and everything. So he participated in the congregation and the organizers were so happy, they gave him some silver lamp and silver uh, you know, pot and a shawl and all sorts of gifts and everything. And uh, he put everything in a small bundle in his personal uh, uh, trunk and that was inside a big gunny bag, you know, like a jute bag. And his uh, shishyas were carrying it around. And the journey back to the native town was scheduled that night. And there, there is a Renigunta uh, junction uh, between uh, Tirupati and uh, Bowringpet. And uh, they were all in the, in the middle of the night in the third class compartment and uh, wa waiting. And they would get to Bowringpet, get off and walk down to Mudabagal. So he, uh, as uh, planned, he came to Mudabagal. And people knew that he is going to arrive and uh, when he comes from the sabha everybody knows he is going to get all this silver and everything all these dazzling uh, gifts so people rushed to him when he came and said please show us all the great things you have got and he tells this, uh, one of his students get that bag let us open it and when they opened the knot of that sack the, some staff of a dasaya was there some earthen pot for cooking a wooden gong some rotten pieces of coconut and everything and the face fell and they realized, oh, there was some Dasaya who was a kind of bald, who was in the next, uh, just sitting next to us. By mistake, we have taken his sack and he would have taken another sack. And then uh, Appanacharya says, who knows who that Dasaya is? Who knows where he has gone? How do we find out? This is our fate. So we need to face it. This is, we need to undergo whatever we have received. Uh, that's all. No other lament, nothing. He just accepted. Who knows who that guy is? Where we can find him? Can we go giving, running after him, giving a police complaint, uh, sketching the description of that fellow and all this thing? It is not worth it. This is our fate. Let us accept it. It is easier. Because many times, the amount of time spent in police stations and court cases is much more than the actual value of what you have lost. Then I told you that there were some uh, ill will also. People were living harmoniously, but there are always possibility of some uh, quarrel and uh, some skirmishes, right? So here what happened was there are, there are two major mathas, the Majjige Haldi Matha and the uh, Sri Padraja Matha. Now the, uh, the Swamiji, the uh, Mathadipati of the Sri Padraja Matha would usually be stationed in Mudubagalo. Whereas the Majjige Haldi Matha was... Uh, had a pontiff who used to stay in other places and sometimes come to Mulubagalu. So now the Swami of the Manjiga Heli Matha wanted to come to Mulubagalu. There was an obstacle. The uh, main street of Mulubagalu was the market street. And uh, here you just, uh, just observe the way in which DVG gives descriptions of the public places. So much of detail, which road, north facing or west facing, Somebody who just uh, carefully reads this will be able to get a mental picture of Mulubagala, that place. Similarly, later when he talks about Gundopanth Road, you will get a beautiful picture of this Gundopanth Road which is still there in uh, KR market of uh, Bangalore. So there is so much of detailing with which, what uh, direction the road was going and what are the uh, major landmarks. All these details are there. 
So he says the Rajabidi, the main street of Mulubagalu was the market street. And the street faces the Sri Padaraja Matha. To the north of the Matha lies the life stream of Mulubagalu, which is a large Pushkarani, which is like a, a lake. And travelling westward on the northern road of this Pushkarani, one reaches the Majjigehili Matha. The intent of this Matha Swami, who was going to visit, and he was wanting to take out a pro procession that was passing directly in front of Sri Padaraja Matha. This would then proceed in the easterly direction, pass through Market Street, turn to the north at the end of the street, then it would turn west, proceed to the north of the aforementioned Pushkarni, and finally return to the Majjigeli Amata. So basically, this was a procession. In a sense, a procession also is a show of power. If there is a huge group of people passing through a certain place, it is a display of power, which is also why even today sometimes there is there are problems and riots because one group of people want to take a procession in front of another group's major center. So this can this is basically a show of power. So the Sri Pajarada Matha came to know of this. They said, "This is no, we can't allow for this." They raised a clamor. If some other Matha takes a procession in front of us, what will ha what will happen to our prestige? And they put a court case. And DVG says, I don't recall which way the judgment went. And he ends this passage with one line saying, Hindus need to always bear in mind this episode. So, so much is left unsaid, but you just look at this one sentence and contrast it with, uh, juxtapose it with some of the major clashes that have happened in the last 20, 30 years, you will know the importance of DVG's observation here. Then finally, at the end of this uh, episode on the galaxy of Madhva Vidwans, DVG talks about a very uh, interesting group called the Sagani Kuta or the Dung Association. Uh, in, uh, uh, in the Madhva Brahmanas, generally there is the Vyasa Kuta and the Dasa Kuta, which can be somewhat likened to the Tengalay and Vadagalay of the Sri Vaishnava community. There is uh, Vyasa Kuta and uh, uh, Dasa Kuta. There was a third Sagani Kuta which was created. Now, as um, you know, typically in the Madhva Brahmana community, the tendency for orthodoxy and following certain ritualistic practices is little more than the Sri Vaishnava com community. Sri Vaishnava community is little more than the Smartha community, uh, from my observation. Uh, maybe there is some other view on this. But uh, th there is generally a, a tradition uh, which adheres very strictly to ritualistic purity. Ultimately, this is all... Uh, came initially from a, uh, a need to be hygienic and that uh, metamorphed into different kind of practices. So here, uh, there were people who felt that it was not good enough. We have to raise the standard of ritual purity. We have to make it even more pure. And the only way that they could think of is using cow dung. Cow dung is generally considered very pure, right? In many of the older houses, they used to use cow dung as a sort of disinfectant when there was a mud flooring. They would typically do that, and that practice continued. Even when there's a ceramic tiling, some people used to use the... Uh, I myself have uh, uh, seen when I was growing up, people used to use cow dung to clean, which was a, a more symbolic rather than practical value. But anyway, so these uh, people were very strict in following Ekadashi. Ekadashi are not supposed to have anything except water. So if today, if you have had uh, any uh, food, if you are a, a strict Madhva, then it's not uh, the right thing because today is Ekadashi. So on the day of the Ekadashi, they would delay the bathing as much as possible because the moment you have a nice bath, you will start feeling hungry. Not only that, when you have bath, the water will go into the pores of the skin, which is almost like breaking the Vrata. So if you are doing a Nirjala Upavasa, it is like breaking the Vrata. So they will push the having the bath to as late as possible, maybe late afternoon, they will go and have a shower. I mean, dip in the, uh, take a bath in the water in the lake or a, a pond or something. And they will just only have a drop of the sacred tirtha of uh, the uh, Bhagawan. Now, what they did is they said, you know, the cow dung is very important. So the first thing they would do is wake up in the morning and if they want to wash their face, they'll dip the water with little cow dung and wash the face. Anything uh, after that, after the shower, they will burn the cow dung. They will take bhasma and uh, or they will apply the cow dung itself. Uh, they will use the cow dung itself, uh, uh, a pinch of cow dung as soon as, uh, and wash the face. They apply, no, so they, they, they apply a bit of the mud mixed with the cow dung as a kunkuma not basma, sorry. And the cow which was mixed with the dung water would be poured into the tulsi plant. 
and uh, then if they want uh, so, so all these kind of things at every stage they were using uh, uh, cow dung because they were sacrosanct but very soon uh, these uh, practices went away and dvg says he has not personally witnessed any of these things and today there is no one who can even recall its name if, we, if at all we know it it's because dvg has recorded it here otherwise i am sure that most people would not know about it with this we come to the next uh, character uh, kashi raghavendra acharya who was the first sanskrit guru of uh, dv gundappa there were a lot of uh, sanskrit vidwans in mulubagalu but there was no sanskrit patashala there was no formal education center for sanskrit and the uh, three or four schools that were there in mulubagalu did not have that facility and dvg's father was very keen that there must be a sanskrit patashala he would uh, write letters and send applications to the government requesting it to introduce sanskrit classes in the anglo vernacular middle school and until the government accepted his request he appealed to the generosity of the public and convinced kashi raghavendra acharya to join as a sanskrit teacher so this is a crowd funding what today you call crowd funding this is exactly what he has done crowd funding so that not only his son but many children could learn sanskrit so this was the dedication that dvg's father had Raghavendra Acharya was an expert in Sanskrit uh, literature and grammar and uh, he had uh, wanted to study Madhvacharya's philosophy under Avaruru Narahari Acharya who uh, we have already seen and uh, thanks to the generosity of some of the people uh, the school uh, uh, ran with uh, the help and finally Raghavendra Acharya became a government employee when the government accepted that they will add Sanskrit and even today the situation is not too different i feel it is so difficult many times many schools don't uh, have sanskrit as one of the languages people have to request the 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 school there has to be a sizable number of students who are interested otherwise parents have to arrange for some private tuition or some online classes so even today it's not so straight forward if the parents want the children to uh, learn sanskrit then there used to be some clashes between raghavendra acharya and chandrashekhar shastri which has been uh, described because uh, of the uh, uh, timings and uh, the uh, other responsibilities that raghavendra acharya had but what is more interesting is his method of teaching he was although he used to come late sometimes or have some uh, makeup classes and things like that when he was teaching he was extremely committed and he was very strict and disciplined with the students he expected the students to have memorized all the words from the shabda manjari on demand they had to recite verses from the ab abridged ramayana from any portion and the same rule applied to the dhatu patha which is the verbs so the first dictum was to have all the lessons on the tip of the tongue there was absolutely no rebate to this rule if the student missed even a single syllable or letter or made a mistake in pronunciation pure hell awaited him this is what dvg writes and of course he de describes about some of the uh, you know uh, how he used to uh, you know hit the student or uh, hold him between his legs and tweak the ear and so on which which seems a little again you know looking from today's point of view where if the teacher says something little in a louder voice the entire family will come to and put a janda in front of the school at that point of time this is how uh they used to learn and dvg writes although this method of instruction might sound tough to my contemporary readers it wasn't rare in those days and overall we were obstinate and shameless we did not pay heed to any of these punishments and there is always especially at a young age there is some value to rote learning which uh today has uh, almost disappeared from our system of education if it is an adult learner there is some value in learning by immersion or by reading sahitya and then coming to the grammar because it is very boring for a 45 year old person wants to learn sanskrit it is very boring for him to sit and mug up the rama shabda so it is better for him to read ramayana or something and learn it in a more uh, gradual uh, manner and then come to rama shabda there is no avoiding mugging up rama shabda you, you just do it at a later stage 
but when you are a child when the child is so has a ability to absorb anything and everything it is better to help the child memorize you know amara kosha or bhagavad gita or some of the important texts it will be there at beck and call whether it's dhatu paata shabda manjari few things if they memorize at a young age when they are not old enough to ask question why should i learn this what is the advantage before even they reach that stage if you are already they have memorized that's the best thing for further learning and despite him being very strict all the children used to enjoy because uh, his classes because he was a very very good teacher and had passion for teaching which is also something very important when the teacher is very passionate even though they may be a little strict they may be a little harsh uh, at some point of time we are okay with it because the rest of the class is very interesting whereas if a boring teacher is very strict that's the worst combination if you are a bo- bad teacher and you are very kind students will still tolerate you because tumba olle evaru papa yeno gottilla olle evaru or if you are very strict and also extremely competent they will respect you for your knowledge and be afraid of you but if you are incompetent and very very strict that's the worst combination the sure way that the student will develop hatred for that subject and of course if you are a very competent and very kind that is also uh, definitely a, probably the best thing for a student dvg narrates some of the interesting episodes how he used to have a hard time and when they were given uh, the assignment to memorize a few words from the shabda manjari or the dhatu paata during the uh, vacations uh, three fourth of the vacation would go away in play and eating and enjoyment which is true of all of us right when we give a homework in the summer vacation we will start the homework uh, two days before the school begins so this was the what uh, dvg also uh, faced and he was uh, when the days were nearing for the opening of the school suddenly he started getting scared and he said oh my god i have to memorize all these words i have, what's going to happen i am going to get uh, i am pure hell is awaiting me he would have thought about it and he started crying then his grandmother who was an unlettered lady she didn't know how to read and write she said what are you crying about he said i have to memorize this shabda manjari this so many words are there she said give me the book he was like what will you do with the book you can't even read he give me the book and she takes it and she measure, measures this uh, you know this much of this is not even the size of a code bade you can't you are willing to eat so many code bades you can't uh, uh, memorize some 10 words come on be a man don't uh, weep like this can memorize as many as you can so that gave him confidence sometimes even just a simple uh, you know uh, uh, thing like this can uh, energize a person so he memorized the words and then later of course there is another episode of him forgetting his books and thing which i will uh, leave it for you to read but there is one interesting passage that he is supposed to basically they are going on a trip his father has told him to take the two sanskrit books and uh, intentionally he leaves those books and take some other books some related to agriculture and something which is irrelevant which his father also will not read and then in the end he, he gets thrashed for it and so on and he says my father knew only too well that i hadn't left the sanskrit books by mistake i had definitely not forgotten intentionally i have left it because i had developed an aversion to learning it was so difficult and it was uh, i had to memorize so many things the impression that i had about sanskrit was certainly foolish but then if a 9 year old boy must develop wisdom and perspective then he has to be a born scholar like vachaspati mishra he needs to be a great person i don't want a place in that line so this is dvg for you finally in before we go to the next uh, uh, last uh, one interesting episode of kashi raghavendra acharya uh, many years later when uh, after migrating to bangalore uh, rao bahadur dr c b ram rao had requested uh, dvg i want to you know i want you to f- uh, find me a sanskrit vidwan who will be able to deliver a discourse on the mahabharata or the bhagavata or both for one hour every day he should come and he should give a discourse and i would like to listen and immediately uh, dvg says my guru kashi raghavendra acharya is eminent eminently fitted for this i will request him and then slowly every day raghavendra acharya used to go and he would deliver dis- the discourses and so on one day he uh, Uh, came to dvg's house in the morning and he gave a book and uh, he showed him a book and he says what is this in this book can you please read and tell me so there's a bookmark and he takes out the bookmark and can you tell me what this is 
So he, DVG took that in his hand. It was kept as a bookmark in that Bhagavata book that he was giving discourse, which later Rama Rao would probably read from that book and he had kept a bookmark. And it was a menu card. And this menu card was part of a European dinner invitation that Dr. Rama Rao had received. Because he was a very eminent personality, he had received an invitation for a European dinner. And the menu card listed some culinary items which was forbidden for Brahmanas. And therefore, when reading out this list, DVG decided to ignore all the troublesome items and just read the rest of the thing and he said, it's some menu card, let it be. Then Kashi Raghavendra Charya said, don't try to gloss over this. I have already had it read by another person. He was a small boy. He didn't understand the meaning clearly. That's why I'm asking you what it means. Tell me specifically. Then DVG is like, sir, please let it go. It's, somebody must have sent it to Dr. Ramarao. He's just placed it as a bookmark. It uh, doesn't mean he has eaten any of these things. And then Raghavendra Acharya says, all that is okay, but what does it mean keeping this kind of a paper in the Bhagavata? Why should this sort of thing even come in contact with such a sacred work? So then he's uh, open, you know, and his eyes were opened wide and he throws some question, how dare he do this and that, and says, and the Bhagavata program came to an end a few days later. And, and finally, DVG says uh, one beautiful sentence that Kashi Raghavendra Acharya's memory ennobles my life. Sometimes when we think of people who are so pure and so sincere and uh, straightforward, our own life, it becomes a samskara. Sometimes learning from somebody is a samskara. Sometimes uh, being with somebody is a samskara. Sometimes just remembering some people is a samskara. What higher uh, status can you give to somebody in your life? That is Kashi Raghavendra Acharya. Then next he moves on to the Archakas of Mulubagalo. And uh, the temple of Anjaneya in Mulubaglo is very famous. And uh, people from the Hale Mysore region, the Mysore Bangalore region, whenever they went to Tirupati, they would travel via Mulubaglo and uh, visit the Anjaneya Swami Gudi first. And then they would proceed to the journey. In fact, the town seems to have got the name Mulubaglo from this uh, uh, practice is what DVG says. Because Moodalu is east and Bagilu is door. And Moodalu plus Bagilu becomes Moodalu ba Moodala Bagilu, and uh, it is slowly has uh, transformed into Mula Bagilu. In English, it becomes Mula Bagal. Because it is east of Tirupati, it is like the eastern gateway to Tirupati. So the Anjaneya Swami shrine is very uh, prominent, and also that became a reason for uh, that uh, the entire region to be populated by Madhva uh, Brahmanas, and also Sri Vaishnavas were there. Uh, there were, uh, there was a major agrahara of uh, Madhva Brahmanas, like I said. And DVG writes, my other university, apart from my home, was the Anjaneya Swami Devalaya. He never went to any university. Uh, in one of the places, he said, the highest exam that I have passed is the lower secondary, which is 8th standard. So he is a 10th standard fail. So for him, the university... There was people like, you know, he says later in uh, some other places, he has said, so the Vashyam Devadi was a university for him. His home was a university and the Anjaneya Swami Devalaya was a university for him. Whenever he had the time, he would go there with his friends and so on. He learned so much. Then he talks about how his uh, grandfather's brother, Ramana, was a trustee and he had donated a lot of money to the uh, temple and things like that. And there is a very detailed description of the temple. So just by reading this, you can visualize. And of course, even today, you can go to Mulubagal. It's a beautiful uh, place and uh, there, are temples, uh, uh, the tem there are multiple temples there, actually. And uh, in this episode, primarily, DVD is talking about the Archakas, or the people who are responsible for the temple, who perform all the puja and who take care of everything. The vision and the expertise of the archakas of a temple are very important. That dis determines whether the temple is maintained well. Not just the uh, traditional practices and rituals, but even the cleanliness of the uh, place, growing of beautiful flowers and uh, trees around it, the maintenance of the garden. All these things were so good in uh, the Anjaneya Swami Devalaya and Mulubagula because of the archakas. It is not because of a government mandate, DVG writes. The government simply carried on the tradition of the Devalaya handed from an ancient time. 
every once uh, once or twice in a year the amaldar would visit he will have the darshana and he would leave he was just like a supervisor so the everyday administration was in the hands of the archakas and they were very very efficient which is why this uh, uh, temple was so popular so the archakas were primarily uh, from the vaikhanasa tradition of the shri vaishnava parampara now in the shri vaishnava parampara there are multiple divisions one of the divisions is the pancharatra pancharatra and the vaikhanasa and uh, the vaikhanasa uh, basically they are connected with the krishna yajurveda and the vaikhanasa kalpa sutra and a uh, lot of the prominent vishnu devalayas in the south india are following the vaikhanasa agama like the tirupati temple and uh, also veeranjaneya swami temple the chennakeshava swami temple in uh, uh, machli patnam sundara varadaraja perumal temple in kanchipuram and so on now uh, dvg says i personally feel that the vaikhanas are uh, vaikhanasas are more magnanimous than the pancharatras because they are not imbued with a hatred towards shiva and he talks about some of the prominent vaikhanasa um, uh, people uh, from that uh, tradition now the archakas of the anjaneya swami temple were not only expert in uh, you know the uh, uh, managing the day to day rituals of the temple and uh, administrative tasks but they ensured the administration was methodical the entire place was very very clean the garden was very lush they took care of safeguarding the jewelry and the clothing of the deity which is also very important the vessels utensils they ensured that utsavas were conducted on the correct date referring to the almanac all the celebration should happen on schedule and they did this work with great professionalism now just think about it a person who is in the archaka of a temple is no less than a manager or a ceo of a company so the the responsibilities and the work and the acumen that is required is pretty similar but somehow we see oh he is archaka of a temple it is some lowly thing whereas if he is a ceo of some company we think it is a great thing but when we go into the details of their uh, the work that they do and the, the competence that is needed then slowly we will develop some respect and reverence to all these people and most important thing is the archakas possess genuine affection for the people this is something that dvg mentions again and again and he even quotes a line where the glory of a place of pilgrimage lies in the strength of the tapas of the archakas this is very important devata kshetra mahatmya archakasya tapo balat this is what he says the archakas of mulubaglo were living epitome were living were the living epitome of this saying then he speaks about one specific archaka by name krishnappa who was a very erudite scholar and he was a friend of venkata rama shastri or natti shastri whom we had seen in the first volume of uh, the series and uh, natti shastri and venkata rama shastri every afternoon at about 3 or 4 they were good friends they would uh, spend the time together in the village they they would sit on the stone bench in front of krishnappa's house they had a small nutmeg box that had uh, clay marbles made of clay there were several uh, 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 marbles made of clay and it would all be filled up in one of the nutmeg boxes in the other box would be empty and by turn they would say shri ramaya namaha and shift one marble from box 1 to box 2 and this was the evening japa but during the course of this japa if somebody walked by they would engage in a casual banter some potter will come how are you doing what is happening or some washerman subha how your donkey was hurt the leg of the donkey has it healed now are you doing better then limestone mada i heard you burnt your hand how is it now show me and let me have a look at it and this kind of casual conversation with everybody of the village who were passed by they would engage and all the while be repeating shri ramaya namaha so the japa also happened some general discussion also happened what a fine way to spend an afternoon without any it doesn't cost anything you don't need anything except you need to have the right attitude and this is the manner in which uh, the respect for such people also increased among the common common folk so dvg writes in this manner flowed the twin feelings in the life of elders of bhakti towards shri rama and affection towards the world both of these were inseparable in their lives now from mulubaglo let us now come to bangalore we come to this place called gundopanth road 
So Gundopanth Road is named after one Divan Gundopanth. Even today, you can it's called Gundopanth Street now. I think it is. If you get off at KR Market Metro Station, it is right there. Uh, it's uh, to the north of City Market, where we traverse from Arcot Srinivasa Charlu Road towards Dodda Pete. I think even now there is Arcot Srinivasa Charlu Road, and you get Gundopanth Street. DVG gives a little bit of introduction to who this Gundopanth was. Basically, uh, he seemed to have been a very generous person and did a lot of charity, that much we know. Uh, this uh, uh, area where Gundopanth stayed became a sort of an agrahara uh, called Gundopanth Agrahara. And this uh, Gundopanth's house is located right in the middle of a cluster of houses in the northern portion of the road that is named after him. The Irish press, which was the office of the Karnataka newspaper, where which was started by DVG, was there. And then there was the office of the Mysore Economic Review, which was a journal published by the great political historian Rao Bahadur C. Hayavadan Rao. And later the banana market and other commercial establishments developed there. Now, during Gundopan's tenure, there is a very interesting incident that happens. He used to organize a lot of festivals, celebrations, and concerts, which is very typical. Like some, At that point of time, if somebody was uh, uh, having a certain amount of wealth or influence, it was very common for them to have some gamaka program or a music concert or some uh, uh, harikatha performance and so forth. DVG's friend had mentioned uh, to him about a grand musical concert that was uh, organized in the hall in the first floor, which was at that time the office of the Karnataka, but uh, before that, when it was Gundopanth was alive, there was a huge uh, hall, and that they, they had organized the concert of the renowned singer and composer Mysore Sadashiva Rao. And the venue was packed full of people, and he's a very well known person, so a lot of people. And on the eastern wall of that uh, uh, particular hall, there was a small uh, uh, niche which had a beautiful picture of uh, Sri Krishna and a huge portrait which is about five feet uh, wide and five feet tall and there was a sort of glass uh, covering for that. So usually when there was a concert or something, they'll open the glass and they will light a lamp and uh, and this, uh, this painting was a beautiful painting of Krishna with the two of his wives, Radha and Rukmini and it had color like a gemstone colors, a very, very brilliant painting and uh, uh, Sadashiva Rao was uh, sitting in front of it. He started singing one of his own composition, Narasimhudu Udayin Chenu. And uh, he starts singing it and he, in a very high pitch. And he reaches the Charana line, Nidu uh, Paramad Bhuta Maina. So this line he was singing, probably was doing a Naraval and everything. He was in, uh, singing with a lot of fervor. The pitch was very high. And at one point of time, the flame became very, very intense and glowed with a lot of uh, uh, like energy and the glass uh, cracked uh, because of the high pitch, which happens, right? Some of the uh, opera singers also have demonstrated by singing in a certain pitch, the glass will crack. And everybody was amazed and immediately Sadashivara got up, performed a Mangala Arati and then sang the Mangalam and finished the concert. And people were speaking about it for a long time after that because it was such an extraordinary event. Uh, I don't know whether even now they call this place Siddhi Kate, but earlier KR Market was called Siddhi Kate, and I think old Bangaloreans will still call it uh, by the name Siddhi Kate. So this had a Purnaya's uh, Chowl tree was there. There was a big well and a temple which was on the eastern end of Gundopanth Road. Uh, there were two important uh, groups here. One, Vidyanidhi Vasudeva Shastri's house was there. In, uh, in that area, which meant a lot of his students, who are all Smartha boys, would come and learn. And there was also the Purnayas Chowtri, where a lot of Madhva boys would stay. So there was an opportunity for the Madhva and Smartha boys to be together. The spectacle resembled, DVG says, two clay pots tied at each end of a rope and made to collide with each other. So the inevitable uh, result is going to be a fight. So there used to be heated arguments and then somebody would say, oh, your Shankaracharya did this. And then some Smartha boy will say, oh, your Madhvacharya did that to him. And uh, the same thing what Madhvacharya has uh, condemned was countered by Sureshwaracharya in this manner and they would have arguments. 
and some one occasion this heated argument turned into a physical fight and it was uh, it was a full fledged fight and then somebody called the police and uh, they were arrested both the groups and put them in jail and this case was uh, presented before the chief magistrate vaidyanath ayer so he patiently listened to all this thing and realized these guys are just you know kids and they are, have no damn clue what they are talking about and he said listen to all of them and he said what nonsense all this thing in what period did shankaracharya live in what period did madhvacharya live do you know this simple fact tell me which period what is his period and they have no idea they have absolutely no idea they just uh, you know fighting because we are in this side and he said you are resorting to hooliganism without knowing the basic facts it's okay you are all very young so you are doing this kind of monkey business but i don't want to punish you severely so if you will give me an undertaking that you will behave well then i will release you so they all wrote a good behavior bond and signed it it was valid for one year and the sort of hooliganism never repeated after that this is uh, the uh, story of the fight between the two groups now we see it like ganesh sir is saying it happens in facebook and other uh, forums uh, but uh, one must remember all these fights among the different factions are all mostly verbal fights nobody will take a, a gun and shoot somebody or take a knife and cut somebody's throat this is very very rare um, almost it is hilarious if somebody says a madhva got angry or a shri vishnu got angry and took a gun and shot a smartha it will be more a joke rather than anything serious so this is something very important for us to remember in our tradition most of it is all verbal duels and verbal uh, uh, um, uh, fights now we come to vasudeva shastri's family of disciples vasudeva shastri was a very great scholar and perhaps the first person to get the honorific vidya nidhi from the maharaja of mysore he also earned fame as jagan mithya vasudeva shastri because in one of the vakyarthas or the scholarly debates he gave so much of evidence and uh, references from the different shastras and uh, smritis and uh, shruti to show that brahma satya jagan mithya so brahman is true and everything else is false the the, the world is false and he established it very well and the jagat guru of uh, the shringeri matha was also very pleased and he called him um, jagan mithya vasudeva shastri which uh, stuck apart from many other uh, subjects he was particularly uh, unrivaled scholar in tarka vyakarana and mimamsa so tarka is uh, logic uh, mimamsa is uh, the uh, textual exegesis uh, and it has two parts uttara mimamsa purva mimamsa and vyakarana is grammar and several well known panditas of bangalore were actually his students later when you if you see the list so many great people were all his students so uh, narayana shastri sagire narayana shastri devagondi narayana shastri doddabale narayana shastri and uh, sunday koppa venkatesh shastri so many people who are well who became went on to become very well known vidwans were all his students now doddabale narayana shastri is one such remarkable scholar and he has uh, rendered immense service to kannada literature so one of the main things that he did is word for word translation and a fantastic commentary on the jaimini bharata which is uh, probably 16th 17th century uh, retelling of the mahabharata by the poet lakshmisha and uh, he also has written commentaries on sanskrit texts such as bhagavad gita viveka chudamani and uh, kalidasa's raghuvamsha in addition to this he wrote uh, several booklets and books independent books like devara seve he wrote a uh, uh, bhajan uh, called hanuman namamrita uh, he uh, he also written bhajans uh, in uh, praise of several other deities he ran a monthly magazine called sharada for the uh, shivaganga shankara matha then he uh, he was running a periodical called vidyananda and when he was running vidyananda a very interesting episode happens which i will come to later and uh, all these works which he uh, wrote commentaries on bhagavad gita viveka chudamani invariably it was first published in these periodicals only later it came out in book form his uh, writing style was very lucid it was mainly meant for the generality of the public it was popular readership 
then devanagundi narayana shastri was uh, another uh, vidwan who learnt from i think he learned from vasudeva shastri for some time but primarily he was a student of sagre narayana shastri one point of time uh, dvg came to know about narayana shastri devagunda narayana shastri's uh, sorry state of affairs in terms of finance uh, knowing this uh, situation he wrote a letter to b ramakrishna rao who was controller of the palace in mysore and saying that there is a great scholar he is in a lot of difficulty so it would be very nice if you could support him then after writing this letter for 4 5 months nothing happened and um, dvg also almost forgot about it uh, about 6 months later one day he was working in the office of the karnataka newspaper suddenly uh, devagunda narayana shastri comes up to him and says uh, he has an envelope in his hand and uh, he they they are conversing in telugu they used to speak in telugu he said uh, you are younger than me still i would like to offer my namaskara to you and uh, dvg is wondering what is this and and he his face was almost he was on the verge of having tears in his eyes he had such a plaintive expression uh, he, and uh, dvg stops him in his attempt to do namaskara i said what is the matter and he places the envelope in dvg's hand uh, dvg opens it and sees it is a letter from the palace Vidwan Devagundana Narayana Shastri has been hereby appointed as the Asthana Vidwan that's what it said and he silently lets out a prayer of gratitude to Ramakrishna Rao uh, you know so nice that he paid uh, heed to my request DVG asked uh, Shastri so how does this appointment help you i will get about 5 or 6 rupees every month from this and dvg says that's all 5 or 6 rupees a month and you are doing all this circus come on what is this then he, uh, shastri says swamin you are still very young people like you must learn about the appalling condition of people like us i was a disciple of a great vidwan sagre narayana shastri when i went to visit him one afternoon he was sitting with his hand uh, uh, with his head on his hand and in deep thought and usually when i went to his house immediately he would acknowledge my presence by saying come in how are you this time when i went he did not even see me and i had to uh, g- uh, get his attention by um, talking to him and uh, i started as i said what is the matter sir do you have a headache and sagare narayana shastri said yes i have a headache i have a headache today tomorrow it will be your turn to have a headache then uh, i asked him what is this what are you saying he said see i learned tarka under my guru the great vasudeva shastri vidyanidhi vasudeva shastri 12 years i studied tarka this headache is a result of that work now after a few days i had to perform my father's shraddha i was thinking of some means to arrange for it i don't have the thing i used to take credit from the grocery shop and other people but i have taken a lot of credit i have not repaid the old uh, loans so nobody uh, nobody is giving me the thing so instead of taking uh, learning tarka for 12 years i should have taken up a job as a clerk or as a school master or something else i think it would have been much better i wouldn't have suffered this headache so this i think is the only benefit of learning tarka the infant has died only the smell of its cloth in the cradle has remained my shastra education is complete what has remained is this headache and this is what my guru told me narayana shastri tells dvg my current fate is pretty much the same now because you have helped me get this uh, uh, salary from the palace i can be little bit more comfortable and i offer 1000 namaskaras to parameshwara in this backdrop i would like to narrate a small episode that happened uh, probably during the second lockdown when i was mostly at home somebody uh, through a reference called me and said uh, i want to take your advice i said what is the matter he said you know now with this uh, western education has come to our country sir i don't want our children to study the western education so i am thinking of sending my son to study tarka and nyaya shastra from the first standard he will learn only nyaya he will become a master of nyaya shastra it is better to be a master of nyaya shastra than you know doing all this western education so then i told him what is the uh, financial uh, implication of this uh, what how will he earn money and fend for himself when he finishes this okay he can learn nyaya but what is the end result 
is that sir if everybody is start thinking like this then what is the uh, you know fate of our old shastras then i told him see i have not studied nyaya i don't know about it but from reliable sources i know that whatever really relevant nyaya shastra is required today for in the modern world can be condensed to about four pages and that can be read by anybody who has got basic education in uh, you know in a school who have studied 12 standard uh, some 12 standard pass can read these four pages and understand what is relevant for practical life just to know nyaya shastra for the sake of that anybody can study it but practically today if somebody want to read it it can be condensed to four pages this is what i have heard so therefore it makes more sense to study whatever subjects that is there in school and in the side you can learn nyaya or mimamsa whatever preferably vedanta because it will be very practically useful for the child's life but um, what is the point in doing so even in 21st century if somebody wants to do this then one can think about the grave danger at least those days there was a palace there was one poor ramakrishna rao and one maharaja who was able to give 6 rupees today even if somebody studies tarka who is going to give them even 6 rupees forget about what it's equivalent today <laughs> you will not even get any because uh, we have to be practical one is to preserve the shastra and everything today we have such a fine uh, me- me- mechanism to record all the old texts and everything we have recordings we have archives so a mere preservation need not be done by a large number of people even a few people who are interested to dedicate their time is enough whereas it is important for people to develop economic prosperity so that they can support uh, whether it is their own study even if somebody want to study sanskrit uh, deeply today it is important for him or her to have a financial stability it's very difficult for somebody to say i will just study sanskrit and do nothing else where will you get the money so whether to support yourself or to support another individual who is interested in pursuing culture first we have to be able to be financially stable and whatever is required for that financial stability we have to do it so it is very important one can have a very romantic notion of studying all the old subject but it is equally important to study science to study what is happening in the world have real connection with the world and be able to generate revenue from the marketplace only then we will have some uh, value in the uh, in the eyes of the people and that also will help us to get some sort of stability once you make your money of course you can do whatever you want that's not a problem i just took a little digression because there is a lot of uh, renewed zeal today without understanding what these things uh, contain the uh, some of the very very uh, uh, you know enthusiastic parents want to send their children to these kind of places tomorrow if the child realizes that this education was not helpful for him to earn any money he will only have curses for the parents and nothing good so therefore to some extent it makes a lot of sense to have the general education along with that definitely you can study amara kosha and sanskrit and veda whatever you want to learn whether it's carnatic music or whether you want to learn dancing or painting or anything along with the mainstream education it is definitely useful and later if after 18 if the uh, son or daughter wants to take it up with a full time interest then they are adults they can take their own decisions but at a young age it is important to keep in mind the future uh, situation no vasudeva shastri coming back to vidyanidhi vasudeva shastri he had a huge house and lot of disciples always there would be people he would impart meals to so many people teach so many individuals and whether it was tarka he would teach vyakarana purva mimamsa uttara mimamsa or vedanta and even jyotisha and like i said several of his uh, students uh, went on to become very very renowned pandits and scholars dvg writes about vasudeva shastri's brother in law one siddhanti subramani shastri who was very well known in jyotisha and uh, subramani shastri had also translated a sanskrit work called upanishad sara in which he had given the essence of the upanishads and the brahma sutras um the uh, vyakarana garani krishnacharya was a good friend of his and siddhanti subramanya shastri son was the very well known maha mahopadhyaya shiva shankara shastri uh, shiva shankara shastri was the president of the kannada sahitya sammelana in bijapur and his entire presidential address was apparently in the form of a poem he was so skilled in writing poetry and uh, shiva shankara shastri also was what was known as a daivagnya uh, sort of astrologer a person who had 
some uh, uh, who had learned the secrets of mantra and tantra, so he had some sort of a supernatural ability, perhaps. And he was a devotee of uh, Subramanya. Uh, one of the episodes where uh, uh, you know his uh, uh, Shiva Shankar Shastri's ability comes to the fore is when Bellave Venkat Naranapa was studying for his MA degree. Uh, he stayed in Madras and he was studying for his MA degree. And uh, like we have seen Naranapa in one of the older, epi uh, older lectures, I spoke about him in the third volume uh, in, in some detail, is an extraordinary personality and also one can imagine what sort of a disciplinarian he was. And when he was a student, he was so disciplined, he would study by cutting short food and sleep, almost like somebody performing a tapas he was studying. So naturally with that sort of uh, uh, intense study and work, he developed some uh, fever and he was in really poor health. Uh, many times he would just lose consciousness and he would faint. And uh, they were living in Alsur Pet near V.B. Subaya's house, who was also a relative of, uh, um, of uh, um, Vasudeva Shastri. So then uh, his, uh, they, the Vas Venkatanapa's family was very uh, concerned and they grew worried. This man is always studying and he's uh, you know, getting unconscious what to do. So then this news was conveyed to Shiva Shankara Shastri. Then he administered some vibhuti and kunkuma and some bilva leaves and akshata. And this, uh, this is what cured Venkat Naranapa, is what DVG says. And uh, he uh, later became you know, in charge of the administration here in the Mount Joy uh, hillock. And he conducted all the pujas and everything in the Kumaraswami Devalaya. A lot of people would come, especially since he was a Daivagna, a lot of people came for help and he was uh, always supporting them by giving treatments involving mantra and tantra. So this is uh, the uh, large family of disciples of Vasudeva Shastri. Uh, if I have time, I will quickly go into another very, very interesting and uh, 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 colorful personality, which is Bala Saraswati, uh, or the Tamashe Tanda, or the playful gang, which is what the DVG calls it. Now on um, Arkot Srinivasulu Road, there was a printing press of Navaratna and Sons. So sometime in 1908-1909, DVG was regularly there. He was working there. And he was friends with the Navaratna and Sons uh, people. Uh, so every day he would spend some time there. His workplace was nearby. And one of the people who visited the place regularly was uh, uh, Thirumale Venkatacharya. Uh, Thirumale Venkatacharya is uh, incidentally the uncle of Tita Sharma, who is a well-known journalist who was running Vishwa Karnataka newspaper. Now, Venkatacharya was a teacher, he had authored some plays in Kannada, and often he would come to the Navaratna and Sons printing press to get his plays uh, printed. So he, was, uh, he has written a lot of plays and uh, uh, some interesting episodes uh, uh, happened there. But one story that stands out is when, uh, he had, when DVG visits Venkatacharya's house one afternoon. Uh, at that point of time, uh, uh, Venkatacharya used to live in Mamul Pet, and the Karnataka newspaper was still running. Usually, uh, during the lunch time, the compositors would take a break. They would go for lunch. Compositors are people who use the movable type and actually fit every single letter would be fixed, and then ink would be applied, and then uh, the paper would be pressed. So the compositors were the people who arranged the letters. They would go for lunch, and they, that would be a sort of free time for DVG. So sometimes, whenever he had uh, the opportunity, he would go to Ven uh, Venkatacharya's house. Once uh, he went into the uh, house, into the living room, and they, usually Venkatacharya and DVG, even Tita Sharma and DVG, they usually spoke in Telugu. And there is no logic for this. In fact, uh, once I was discussing with SRR, he said, uh, sometimes two people connect well in a certain language. There is a, a language, intimate language between two people. There is no logic for it. Now, if I know three languages, another person knows the same three languages, we may speak in one language which is comfortable, which we started out speaking for some reason. Or we may speak a mixture of two languages. So DVG used to speak with Tita Sharma and other people in Telugu. He would speak with Srinivasa Shastri and uh, Shiva Swami Iyer, all of them in Tamil. With his daughters, he would only speak in English. So it is, there is no reason for it. It just, you get used to some uh, something. For example, I speak with all my family members only in Tamil. Whatever happens, I will speak in Tamil. My brother and my mother only speak in Kannada. So there is no logic for that. They are used to speaking in Kannada for some reason. Whereas me and my brother and we will speak in Tamil, my mother and I will speak in Tamil. There is no logic. 
so like this sometimes our relatives we will speak in a certain language or friends we especially in a school we are used to speaking english in school even though they also know kannada i also know kannada we end up speaking in english so like this there is some language of intimacy and there is no logic for this so anyway their conversation began in telugu he said uh, what's for lunch he asked ventacharya extremely delicious sir please please join us really what is so delicious about it lovely rice lovely rasam says that's all rice and rasam such a exaggerated praise for rice and rasam mere rasam you are saying what do you know sir it is supremely delicious so he says what is so special because rasam and rice is very common what is so special about the taste it is like smooth brandy it is slurp worthy top class brandy then dvg is how does brandy taste have you consumed brandy sir our ancestors talk about amrita have they consumed it and if they had consumed amrita would they not be still alive today the fact that they have died is a sure indication that they have not consumed amrita but what you are trying to say is that it was an extraordinary taste that's what they said they meant by amrita so i used brandy in a similar way to imply the same sense it is a qualifier that is indicating a compliment for it so this is just a tiny sample of the kind of conversations that he would have with uh, even with venkata acharya and so many other people then around that time i think uh, maybe a, a couple of decades later i think in the 20s sometime uh, he had uh, done a poetic uh, translation of uh, lord tennyson's play the cup as uh, uh, kanakaluka oh in 19 in the 1907 1908 that period itself right so he had done a translation of the cup and it dvg would have done it as just as a casual thing just to try his hand at translation knowing his uh, uh, his intentions he would have just given a shot let's see you try this but venkatacharya was so uh, was so excited about it he says i am going to bring this play onto the stage because he was involved in some drama and other thing he said we will bring to the stage then he would drag dvg and take him along to various street we should get the actor right actors for this so he will start hunting for the actors and then we they went uh, looking for one guy called drama rangappa and finally there was one photographer and painter by name muddayya and uh, muddayya is very well known because he painted the very famous picture of devi sharadamba of shringeri which is seen everywhere he was uh, uh, the person who painted it and Mundaya was a painter but also he was a photographer and those days you can imagine in 1909 1908 it is very rare to have a photography studio and it was uh, maybe in the the only time they would take a photograph is during a wedding they could afford to take a wedding photograph where so many people would be there in one frame some 78 people in one frame and that was the only photograph that was available and that would be stuck on a cardboard uh, 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 sheet and which is a thick cardboard i'm sure many of you would have seen it a black and white picture in a very very beautiful resolution it that was it would usually be framed or so this was the only time that photos were taken it is not at all common but venkatacharya insisted and muddaya complied and they wanted a cover page for this kanakaluka drama so you just see it is just a casual thing that somebody has written but so much of interest is taking we should we should do it professionally and they get a, a stage actor make him wear a stree vesha and then take a photograph of this guy and uh, bring it out as a cover page dvg writes the memory of this act of pure friendship is clearly still etched in my mind so this is uh, the background so Venk Venk venkatacharya and dvg were friends and uh, next to the navaras the, the, the amaratna and sons press was on arkat srinivasalu road the central mahambadan association was very close to this press and vidwan bala saraswati lived in a house which is to the south of this building and he was very close friends with venkatesh venkatacharya so therefore venkatacharya took dvg to bala saraswati's house and introduced him now bala saraswati was a school master if he is a school master what subject did he teach one may naturally ask it is very difficult to determine dvg says at some schools he taught sanskrit some other school he taught kannada for some time in a few schools he served as a drawing master for a few weeks he also worked as a music teacher in some schools so you can imagine the range of this man's uh, ability dvg says it is essential to describe his personality a very very strong interesting person 
he was married and had two or three children you just observe how carefully dvg mentions this and leaves the rest to your imagination he was married and had two or three children as far as i can remember when i made his acquaintance his wife and children were living in her father's house in mulubagulu if i recall correctly bala saraswati was living alone throughout the period i knew him he would eat in some restaurant and lived in some rented house or the other if there was a humorous or light hearted conversation at whatever place he would join leisurely time was never a restriction so his family life without saying anything uh, uh, you know bitter or uh, spicy or negative it gives you a beautiful uh, picture and also the harsh reality without going into details his he was short and not stout his complexion was slightly ruddy exquisitely combed hair a well cultivated beard and all the thing he is describing his uh, personality I and mean, his physical features and very penetrating sharp eyes and everything he spoke in such good sanskrit dvg says i have not seen anyone who could equal him equal him in speaking sanskrit with such easy rapidity using the most appropriate words and phrases if he sat down for an argument his sanskrit prowess would flow like a deluge then once dvg was talking to uh, krishna rao the deputy inspector general of education department and krishna rao uh, then the name of bala saraswati came up and krishna rao widened it, uh, widened his eyes and said oh bala saraswati he is extraordinarily brilliant but uh, how does one put up with him this again is so instructive so nice and uh, he gives a little bit of background and then uh, once uh, dvg tells bala saraswati bala saraswati was also very well versed in sanskrit grammar so dvg says i have to learn sanskrit grammar from you sir you must teach me oh definitely we can we can learn sanskrit grammar please come to my house we will start tomorrow itself one hour we will sit and study sanskrit grammar so every day we will have one lesson and he used to go regularly not a single day the lesson has progressed beyond a few minutes because he will start with some sutra oh we will take up a lesson now we will do this about 4 or 5 minutes later the entire discussion would digress to something else leading to some other discussion about a variety of subjects and after some 15 or 20 days of trying to learn some sanskrit grammar dvg said i don't think i can do this anymore and he gives up his learning of sanskrit grammar so the lesson to be learned or what we can understand is the range of conversation that they could have there is so much to share so much to discuss and uh, such a wide variety of uh, uh, reading and erudition of both these people that it was not possible to sit and spend one hour a day on a boring thing like sanskrit grammar they had so much more interesting things to discuss then he talks about uh, bala saraswati's uh, uh, you know ponchon for frequent baths and he would just buy some 20 dhotis or 15 dhotis and never wash them he says the dhotis had never seen water so after a period of time if he had to go and meet some important person or he has to go for attend a, uh, a ceremony he would put all the clothes in a big pile and he would see which is the least dirty dhoti let me pick that and use it and sometimes when all the dhotis are dirty he would take a few of his friends like dvg go to the shop and he would pick up a set of 5 or 6 dhotis and he say ha huh, this is going to last me for another 6 months or one year i don't have to worry so this was his uh, uh, his uh, way of dealing with uh, clothing uh, i think i will take a uh, uh, i will take a few minutes maybe uh, to complete this episode i uh, i will beg your indulgence for another 5 minutes Uh, there used to be a gathering of venkat uh, venkatacharya bala saraswati and vidwan gopa gopalayya and another vidwan that dvg is forgotten his name and they would spend time for a few hours every day for about 3 years and all these vidwans are much older than dvg the fact that they could have this conversation every day they would meet every day and discuss and the discussion would not have any fixed topic the optimum mix of ingredients for preparing a dal or it could be whether jalebi is better or laddu is better what is the right way of elaborating a certain raga the word usage in magha's poetry what is the speciality of that and sometimes politics 
now a few of us like sandeep and me have this great fortune of spending every saturday with dr s r ramaswamy in his office it is uh, 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 popularly known in our circle as anubhava mantapa just the fact that we are able to meet him once a week for about one or one and a half hours gives us so much of joy and so much of learning we go back every time enriched imagine doing that for uh, 3 years every day how much of learning what you can never learn in any university any college you will learn it from these vidwans so if people wonder how dvg being a 10 standard failure could learn so much it is these are the universities these are the colleges he attended which is far more valuable than any university or college in the country at that time or even today so this is uh, the comfort and leisure that they had then there is one very interesting episode that happens uh, i had uh, i had told you about dodabele narayana shastri earlier and he was running this vidyananda uh, newspaper uh, this was a periodical uh, dvg had composed a poem in praise of jagat guru uh, shankaracharya of uh, shringeri Sh- uh, matha at that time and this was all ready and uh, his uh, this vidwans who were the four uh, friends of his they said oh this is so nice we have to get it printed and jagat guru is coming to bangalore i think at that time we should uh, give this to him he was he was going to be here for some chaturmasya or something so they were some three or four poems they wanted to publish it and like a like a single pa- piece of piece of paper i think like a pamphlet and uh, you know distribute it they had all the typesetters had made the blocks ready and it was the proofs were ready and it was just going to be printed at that time this uh, our vidwan doddabale narayana shastri who was publishing the vidyananda periodical he happened to see this and he saw that some jaya shankara jaya shankara guru shekara bhagavan and he was not very happy he made a correction vara deshika bhagavan and then he and the proof readers and the compositors they are it's basically their boss who has written this padya right so they were like sir how can you change it no no he is one of my boys don't worry he won't mind it and he goes away and then these people who had gone out for a walk they come back bala saraswati and uh, you know venkatacharya and uh, dvg and then suddenly they look at this they scared no no we didn't do anything this uh, narayana shastri he has done this dvg went to dodabele narayana shastri's house and uh, Up, uh, they had a huge uh, argument and uh, about 2:30 or 3 in the afternoon everybody comes bringing this narayana shastri with them and this narayana shastri the moment he saw dvg he says what is this man you have sent an army after me can i remain alive in their clutches then he explained he said see i read your poems it is all very good but in one place you have said guru she khara bhagavan if you change if you split it as guru she khara bhagavan it is not good the yatisthana is little weak that's why i changed it and then venkatara venkatacharya and balasadu oh ho oh, oh, you are you are changed the, the you are complaining about this what about this varade shika bhagavan varade shika bhagavan is he a sick adi shankaracharya is a sick what kind of thing is this and they started creating a galata so then the dvg fell at their feet and said please i request both of you you stop this i don't want this to continue further let us uh, you know uh, we will just stop this and then uh, narana shastri is what is this these fellows are like indrajit my good fortune they didn't take my life <laughs> and there was all round laughter and everything finally dvg takes this to chappalli vishweshwara shastri who checks with his son kashipati shastri and another sundara shastri and everything although this is a very humorous episode what lies underneath it is although it was a simple three or four poems written casually for the sake of jagat guru see the amount of peer corrections peer evaluation uh, re- peer review that dvg goes through asking great vidwans to ensure that it should be correct in fact the nyapak chatrashale series itself starts with one such uh, episode where dvg goes to get his work corrected by somebody else so this uh, process of peer review is so important for dvg uh, from a young age he has cultivated this he has never thought oh i have written it so it is good and finally i will uh, end today's uh, presentation with a small uh, very poignant episode that happens in the last days of bala saraswati and he comes to meet uh, bala saraswati as uh, he is a person who was very enthusiastic and he took up lot of tasks but he was not worldly wise and he didn't 
uh, estimate the the uh, the business acumen that was required when you want to start a business he failed in his businesses and did not make uh, much money and one day he came and he was uh, uh, sharing his uh, disappointments with tvg and at that point of time incidentally tvg also was going through a bad phase he was in a, a sort of a depression at that time he was feeling very bad and then balasaraswati said have you forgotten how all those years ago we used to stand every day in the blazing afternoon heat in that pond and we used to talk for hours we need to do this we should accomplish that we will write this book we will publish that book we will create this library and all sorts of thing how we drew up all the elaborate plans this effort will yield this result this attempt will bear that great fruit didn't we build all these castles in the air and fate is now mocking us you sobs the afternoon with that afternoon with bhagwan surya as the witness you made all these grand schemes now execute them now you stupid fellows and all the karma we accumulated back then is still chasing us sir and then uh, he goes away it is so true in all our lives we all make grand plans not everything can come to fruition and when we see that even the great people of the past whether it is a dvg or now with srr so many people in the past they also made great plans they could accomplish some of it which is extraordinary and many things could not be accomplished then in fact even the nyapak chitrashale series the eight volumes what we have srr has often said it's only 10% of what was residing in dvg's head in this being the case we can take some solace that if our plans fail it is okay even the great people have made lot of plans and they too have failed with this i come to the end of today's presentation tomorrow we will see the start with the life of the great chappali vishweshwar shastri namaskara thank you